What's going on? What's going on? What's going on, good people? You already know what time it is, man. You either get right or you get left. You're in the birdcage, man. This is your boy, The Historian. We got a special guest for you tonight. Um, we're going to cap off Black History Month with a historic guest. So please, please, please sit back, relax, enjoy yourselves, because we definitely getting ready to enjoy ourselves. We got a legend in the building. So let's go ahead and get this thing started. You're in the birdcage. Let's go. What's going on, folks? You already know what time it is, baby. We are in the birdcage with your boy, the historian, getting ready to bring in the magnificent birdcage crew so we can go ahead and get this thing started. We got my man, K-Dub, and we got my man, Graybeard, in the building. What's going on, fellas? What it is, what it do, birdcage family, listeners and subscribers, all the people out there ready to get in store for this interview. We got we got some historic things on, on the perch tonight. And we're going to make it happen, man. Great to be in the building with uh, Mr. Graybeard and uh, the historian and the legendary uh, Georgia Tech alum that we're going to have on the show. I don't want to spoil anything. We're going to get into it. If you haven't told you, hit that like, share, and subscribe button. Tell a friend to tell a friend the bird cages in. Let's get it. Without further ado, thank you. I see you. I see you've been practicing your intro. I see you've been practicing your intros, dog. Yeah. I got to <laughs> I, I, hey, I was gonna say I might as well start letting you do introductions. Then take some of this load off your boy. I'm just clowning. <laughs> but, but we, got, we, Glenn, you might have to turn your mic up a little bit, bro. All right, I got you. All right, so we got the legendary Mr. Eddie Mackershan, the legendary Georgia Tech quarterback, as well as the first black quarterback to play in the Southeast. Um, in the South, this, we have this legend joining us tonight. It's a blessing, and it's it's just a wonderful thing. So, how you doing, Mr. Mackershan? Uh, his sound's not working. We can't hear you, Mr. Mackershan. You might have to um. Step out of the stoop, step out real quick and come back in like you did the first time so we can actually have your sound working. Oh, hit that uh mic button. It's a it's a microphone button. You hit that oh, button. He's un no, he's unmuted. I don't I think he might have to step out of the studio and come right back. Okay. So, so uh, if you can leave the studio real quick, Mr. McIshan, and come right back, and that microphone should be working. Can y'all hear me? I can hear you fine. Yeah, we can hear you, but you sound really faint. Really? No, you sound fine to me, Greybeard. I can hear you. Oh, appreciate it. All right. So, 
We're going to uh, get Mr. McIshan to step out of the studio and come back. And while we're waiting on Mr. McIshan to get back into the studio so we can uh, work on um, get him in for this interview that we have, let's address the elephant in the room right now. You got Justin Fields right now trying to become an Atlanta Falcon. You know, it's, it's just rumors that he could possibly be a Falcon. Here's the question. We already know what we've talked about. We know what we want in the draft. We know what we want when it comes to having a quarterback. I feel like in this situation, I think we might as well go ahead and explore those options to see what's up. Because if that option is on the table, I say take them. What do y'all? How do y'all feel? Like I said, you know, uh, wheels are already in motion. Uh, I feel like we take a, take a, a flyer on uh, Justin Fields, a third and maybe a, a fifth round pick, and still go up and go get us a quarterback. And like I said, revolve and uh, reshape that, that quarterback room. That's that's what the uh, my thought process is with, with me right now in that aspect on the quarterback situation. And if we're going to go get any veteran, I would think would, would be Fields because he's young enough for us to develop any other new guys. And everybody's developing on the same pace, even if they're going to keep Desmond Ritter as a maybe a third-string option or something of that nature. But we'll let him fight it out. We'll battle it out in camp and uh, everything of that nature. Well, a couple things. Number one, what is the price tag of Justin Fields going to be? Uh, I already know uh, Chicago wants a King's ransom just to take over the number one overall pick. So, is they going to settle for that third or second round pick, or do they want our eighth round pick and probably another future pick in the next year's draft to acquire Justin Fields? I mean, I'm okay for it, or whatever the case may be, but I still think they can still smoke cream. Uh, I still think they're still trying to dangle some fish out here to see who's going to bite. Because I know Pittsburgh is still in play to try to get Justin Fields and get the uh, Las Vegas Raiders. They're, they're making some headway on trying to acquire Justin Fields services as well. So we, but it's pretty, ob- it's pretty obvious Chicago wants him out. Chicago do not want Justin Fields. And, and that's just, let's just put that out there. They do not want Justin Fields, and they want him gone. The question is, I, which team is going to take the bait? I just feel like I feel like we are on to something a lot earlier because we've been that team, that marquee team that wanted to go get him. Everybody else is late to the party, so I feel like our negotiations are, are long on the way. I think we've been talking to Chicago, and uh, we're trying to play coy, and it's pretty much the deal is done. That's just my that's just my opinion. It's too much smoke. It's too much smoke here, and uh, I feel like they're gonna pull the trigger, and then you'll you'll know within the next week or so. Oh, but that's just my that's just my opinion on it. But I could be totally wrong. We could be the same thing with the Belichick situation, where we feel this way. Uh, the fame base feels one way, and, and it's in the total uh, total smoke and mirrors, and they go a different direction. But I feel like guys coming home, and uh, it is what it is. But I feel like everyone is having to develop because he's learning a new playbook. You know, he, this is not Chicago's playbook. This is not, uh, you know, Ohio State's playbook. He's learning the Atlanta Falcons and uh, Zach and Zach uh, Zach attacks way where he wants to do things. So everyone is going to be on the same accord. They may have played in the NFL. They may have played in the league, but they're going to be on the same accord for us learning the offense. If it's well, Desmond Ritter, if, a, if it's a rookie, or if it's Fields. Well, here's the thing, though, real, real quick, Ryan. Here, here's the thing: if Justin Fields come to us, number one, he's going to have a stable coaching staff to coach him up. He didn't have that in Chicago. We already know that. They put him in, threw him in the fire and he got burned. Not once, not twice, but about three damn times. Let's just go ahead and just call it for what it is. Well here's now, the thing, he thing that you missing. As well. well here's the thing that you're missing. You threw this out there, but you're missing one of the biggest things. Everything has to mesh. Right. If everything doesn't mesh, it's not gonna work. Yeah. Period. So let me see if I can bring Mr. McIshan in here now. He's finally back on. We'll definitely jump on that. So let's go ahead and do this real quick. So, Mr. McIshan, can you hear him? Well, uh, it sounds still not working. <laughs> if you can hit the uh, microphone button again. Hello? Talk now. I thought he was on there. No, like he's a- on there. I think the sound's not working. I don't know what it is. 
So go ahead and hit the um, microphone button that's at the bottom of the screen, and it should be able to unmute it, uh, Mr. Smackishan. His sound is still not working. Man, it's crazy. You think we got to start another link? No, nah, I mean it's not. It's not gonna. It's not gonna help. It's not gonna help because it's the same thing that happened with Randall. There's something going on with Streamyard because he's on. <clears throat> so give me a sec. Let me step out real quick. Sometimes you gotta come all the way out. out, and you guys repost the link. Repost so he has the link. Let me see if I can do it real quick. Give me one sec. All right. <clears throat> So while we are while we're waiting on him, I'm gonna go ahead and put another topic out there for you. Look at all the defensive linemen that are starting to come out this and in, in this in this combine at this point. You have to look at some of the stuff that's gonna happen. It's some monsters that's in there. So we just had we just had we just had we just had uh, Dallas Turner run a full four. So he on he back on my uh, to look boy. Watch out, boy. Fort, I, I, no, the, I'm gonna tell you this here. The fight don't mean two dead flash smash to me. It's the film because when he didn't have Will Anderson, he was suspect and he was pedestrian this year. Look at the no, numbers. I'm not saying take him. I'm saying, but he, but I, 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 I get I, what you're saying. Yeah, but the yeah, dude I'm just, that I'm gonna go after and everybody gets I, I, to And then the guy, the guy I like is is oh boy, I like Jerry I, Verse. Like, I like you. I like Jared like, Verse out of I like Jared Verse out of Florida State because he had to carry. He's carried that load at Florida State since Jermaine Johnson has been gone. And you got to remember, they were bad. They didn't get good until this year. So all I'm saying is this dude right here has been a game record. You go back to the ACC championship game, 12 tackles, four sacks, and eight solo tackles. Hey, man. And that's just a one-man show right there. I mean, no, I like, I, I like, I like, uh, I really truly like, I, I really truly like Jared Burst. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying, you know, that's just the guy that I'm high on is, uh, like two from, uh, UCLA. It's just me. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not knocking Burst. I mean, I think he's a very excellent, good, great player, but I don't know. I'm just saying what, what I've seen on film, the guys that I've seen live play, I've seen a lot of UCLA this year because the Pac 12 was pretty interesting this year. So yeah. that's just my pick. I mean, the combine for what I'm hearing right now, Miles Turner with the four four really, really, really had improved his draft stock. I know a couple of teams are going to be looking at him. The kid, uh, I agree with Mike. The kid from uh, the kid from Missouri looked pretty darn good too. So I wouldn't mind having him. And you know, the kid from UPLA, he he stood out. But Jerry Verse, if we can get him, hey, I'm, I'm game. I'm, I just. As long as we get the players that fit what we're trying to do, it's all about the fit. And I believe all all four of them players that I just named would fit with the defense and what we're trying to do, and especially on the front. So I like. Yeah. It. Then we also got to look at from free agency. You look at uh, Shaq Barrett. Shaq just got a uh, just got cut by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I mean, you look at that. I mean, you can there there's just so many options we can go. Towards towards the team, especially with the cat room that we that we got right now. So, God's the limit, man. Well, I feel like uh, if we don't get any of those guys that we we mentioned that are high up on the draft board, this is not a pass rusher or a defensive end draft. So, if we don't get those one of those top four guys, I feel like we need to address that in free agency. Like you were saying, we got the money for it. We do our due diligence and research across the league, and we can bring in guys uh, that can really help this team moving forward next year and next season uh, that could really improve the team because uh, this is not the draft for your pass rushing in. Everyone says we need that every single season, but this is a se- this this particular draft is heavy on like receivers, quarterbacks, yeah, skill player. uh, players. So, it's, it's, I mean, every draft is different. This is not your draft to go get your pass rusher unless you're going to take them at eight. But I feel like we need to get that quarterback more than we need a pass rusher. Let the guys that we have on the roster, I'm going to stick to that, develop. Develop the guys that you drafted the last few years, the Malones, the uh, the Zach Harris's. All these guys need to develop. Stop passing them over. Stop overlooking them and develop the guys that you brought in the last few seasons and well, stop acting like they're not on the roster. Well, here's the thing. I, I do agree with you, but at the same time, you do need to uh, try to improve as much as possible. So I mean, we still we 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 now have a whole new coaching staff. They got no. to to the whole new coaching staff that we have. So, so hold that thought real quick. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. But I'm gonna see if we can try to get Mr. Mackishan in here again. So oh, give me one sec.
So, Mr. Magashan, can you hear us now? He, I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, you in, okay, you in the game. Yeah. You in the game. And we got him. Let's get it. Let's go. Let's go. You in the game. Let's get it. Good. We so, got Mr. Magashan, welcome to the bird cage. Officially, we had some slight technical difficulties, but guess what? We're going to be great on this last night of Black History because we got a living legend right here in the house with us tonight. Uh, Mr. Eddie Magashan is the first African-American quarterback to be at a PWI, Power White Institution, Power Five, however you want to say it, and he played at Georgia Tech. You know, we're not going to hold it against him or whatnot, even though we dog fans on here. I got to represent from a dog, my bulldogs, but we have a living legend that is from Gainesville, Florida, and one of the best to ever come out of the state of Florida at that quarterback position. So we're going to go ahead and open up the floor. For Mr. McIshan to come through, he was the first guy before Michael Vick was in the city. He was the first before Quincy Carter was in the city. He was the first before Mr. Anthony Flanagan did his thing, you know, did his thing in Georgia before he left. So, without further ado, Mr. Eddie McIshan the third. Welcome to the first phase. Welcome, 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 welcome. Yeah, happy to be here. So, Great to have yeah. So here's a question that we gonna start you with, Mr. Magasham. What got you in the sports, and what made you go to Georgia Tech out of all the schools that you might have had recruiting? Because you're one of a lot of people don't know that you're one of the top 100 athletes out of the state, not only in football but also in basketball too. Well, I tell you, um, my both of my parents were basketball players, and I ended up playing football. They didn't like it too much because they they thought they should have pushed me a little more. And I I I was undecided by the time I was a junior that I had an offer to play at UCLA and uh, look at the players that played there when I played football at Georgia Tech, and they 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 were all great. Uh, uh, Kareem, Sidney Wicks, other players. Uh, but you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. So I, you know, you can't rely on that. But I, uh, I ended up uh, coming to Georgia Tech uh, because I felt like the it was the best city to to uh, play in, uh, being a black quarterback. And uh, most fans think it's it's uh, an easy deal, but I, I ended up every time playing quarterback, every situation, all-star game. I was number one player in the state quarterback, uh, and my stats are a lot better than even in college. So uh, in college, I had defensive coaches. They were they, they knew I could play uh, that – uh, sort of offense where you, you know, you run, it's a, it was a running type offense in the past secondary. Uh, but uh, I managed to still be on the record books after 50 years. So I, I was, I did all right. Went to three straight bowls. Um, but I ended up on a sour note. And so, you know, that's nothing to talk about now, but I, I ended up uh, wiping my leg out my right leg, which was my plant leg out a couple of times, I had some surgery and just never could come back off of that. Hmm. And, and getting, getting to your Georgia tech days, you talk about the bowl games that you guys went to and just coming in, you know, coming out of Gainesville high school, you know, you're the first, you know, you were the first black quarterback to integrate that school at that time as well, because yeah, most of, most of the blacks back in the day, you know, went to Lincoln High School back in Gainesville. That's where my grandfather's from, and I got some family that's around there, so I'm kind of familiar with that, with uh, with old Lincoln back in the day. And you went to GHS, you know, basketball, football, and you. it seems like you you started a trend of being the first and not just, and, and not just Georgia Tech, but you did it in Gainesville, Florida, when you guys – um, when desegregation took place and you were one of the best things smoking. And I'm going to say this for you little lousy Gator fans that are on here. Yes, he is better than Anthony Richardson in high school. I'm <laughs> saying that now. He he is listed as a top 100 player in the state. And, that, and you can't take that away from him. So 
you know, you you definitely were one of the best. Um, I had an uncle that played down in Gainesville uh, named Danny Kilpatrick. He played down there, and um, I think he played at uh, I think he played at GHS. I'm not sure. I got to go back and uh, holler at my um, God rest his soul. I got to holler at my grandmother about that one. But uh, a lot of people talk about you and the heroics that you had being around the city, and just pretty much how you were the best around that way, and how you were able to not only get recruited by Georgia Tech, you know, you wanted to play for the hometown Gators, but they, at that time, they were not ready for an African-American quarterback at that time, even though plus Terry had, Count plus, came years plus later. Had, plus they had John Reeves. He played with the Cincinnati Bengals. So back then, red shirt, red shirting, which they called, which would be transferring now or, or mm-hmm. going to the portal was not popular. In other words, you sit out of here, you may end up at wide receiver or, or defensive back. So John Reeves was a he was above par quarterback, and just like you said too, you didn't know how they were going to take that being a black quarterback. Most uh, fans they don't quite understand it. It's it's been like that in the society, and a lot of them know that, uh, but they think that everything is equal on the on the on the playing field but it's not uh i have situations that i could talk about go on and on about from referees talking to you any kind of way to uh going on trips uh and seeing you being hung on fraternity road from schools like auburn and go over to clemson and you you got all these uh pickup truck driving uh white guys they come where i'm warming up and 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 just make noise you know five thousand just mm. you know just unbelievable like a circus but uh, that's that's just what happened back then and uh now if you look at it the 80 percent of the players are african-american so yeah, yeah it's, you, it's, it's you're the problem, one that helped yeah. start the door down in the south because it was you know it was it's it was most it's mostly hbcus that we were going to or if it wasn't hbcus it was big 10 schools and as you talked about um pac well now the pac 12 is a deceased conference now after you know them joining the big 10 but going yeah. out to the west coast as well yeah. and with opportunities and it's just a question and i'm gonna let my guys ask some questions too um yeah. One of the best bowl, one of the best football games of all time that doesn't get talked about. Regular season game, and it happened in Atlanta, and you know you were the first to play. But it was another historic event, and our guy Brant's gonna love this. You got to play against the other legendary quarterback. He was the first black quarterback in the SEC, Mr. Condridge Holloway. When they came, when Tennessee came down to Georgia Tech, and this was the first time we had two black quarterbacks. Um, going head to head against each other on major network television and ABC that was huge at the time on a Saturday for the primetime game in the country. What was that experience like and how how did you how did you prepare yourself mentally to to get ready for that ball game? Because I know it was a ton of pressure uh, coming coming from uh, coming from where you come from and you guys had to perform at a high level to kind of create opportunities for more that more black quarterbacks that look like you guys. Well, for me, it was uh, normal because that's another reason why I chose to play football instead of basketball is because every snap I got the ball. It, it wasn't like yeah, I got to wait for you to pass me the basketball. I got the ball. So I always felt like that would give me an advantage. And I couldn't play defense, so they beat us. Tennessee beat us. uh they just had a, a, a bit all around offense and we couldn't stop them. So, uh, but it was an experience, you know, being on national TV and something that, that most uh, persons that, that uh, follow football should know. Um, that was a historic uh, game and a historic time uh, back during that, what, 1971, two in there somewhere. Yes, sir. Yeah, it was around. That was around that time because the famous. I'm a boxing fan, so one of my favorite commentators, Jim Lampley, was a sideline reporter for ABC at that time. 
Okay. Back in the day. I remember him. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. I remember him. I, it was a lot happening back then. Uh, I always tell uh, people that, uh, you know, even though I didn't have the, a great career at, at Georgia Tech like most expected, I was here when the Muhammad Ali fought his comeback fight uh, down at the Omni, uh, 1970. I was uh, against Jerry Quarry back in the day. Right. And we mm-hmm. used to talk. I told my I said I did the cover of Jet magazine because I was in between two of the most important African American females, uh Coretta Scott King and Zenona Clayton, and which uh went from from the swamp in Gainesville, Florida to Atlanta, Georgia to Johnson's publishing company to London. You know, that was the first in large jet magazine. Uh, I appeared on the cover, and that helped to really, really give Georgia Tech a up as far as uh, being a PWI with a black quarterback. Hmm. Uh, they didn't take advantage of it, but they uh, even now I have to do my own PR work because the sports information guy over there, he's, he's still a uh, a Southern guy, segregationist, I guess you might say. Mm-hmm. Um, so you still got these guys. You, only a few coaches like Saban and some of the other ones that are coached in the North or either uh, raised in the North, they they seem to be a little lenient, a little more liberal than a third or fourth generation coach that's from the South, even though it's, it's having to change. But they still hold it back on the on the quarterback position, if you notice. So hopefully in the future, uh, now that they've discovered that the quarterback can can make the difference in the game, like Mahomes or or Hertz or Jackson, uh, now they they realize that they can win at the end with a quarterback that can make a decision to run the ball, keep the ball, because he can see the field or either pass the ball. Okay. It's okay, Dub. It's on you, bro. You go ahead and ask Mr. McIntyre what you'd like. Good to have you on the, on the uh, perch, like I said, you know, once again. But i like to uh, ask those uh, tough and uh, some questions that other people don't like to ask. But I just wanted to touch on your, your time uh, with Bud Carson put you in. I mean, what was your thoughts on uh, Bud Carson putting you in and giving you an opportunity? And then also, let's touch touch on, you know, you asking for tickets to the uh, Georgia game from uh, Folger's uh, secretary, and she denied you. you know, what made you want to sit out for a week and not go to practice? You know, talk about some of our listeners what about that. And, and uh, also, just during that time, you know, uh, when you had to, Wait, wait, we waited out in the limousine. I mean, just talk about that time when you said sit out in the limousine for the bowl game. You know, just, just touch on uh, touching some of those, those questions right there, I got for you. Uh, well, actually, it was something that w- they blew up that, that was very petty and it was normal to get an extra ticket from mm-hmm. mostly coaches. Uh, hell, I, I was in high school and got extra tickets from wherever at the University of Florida playing Florida State game. So they blew it out of proportion. And Fulcher, you know, he only coached two years because he was not a he was not a competitive coach, you know. And so uh, unfortunately I got him my senior year and it knocked my draft pick down and I, we, he never we never even talked. See, that's another thing you can really tell if a coach don't talk to his quarterback is something something's wrong there. And that's why I, I, another reason I came to Georgia Tech because I knew Bud Carson was a he was a uh, northern abolitionist minded uh, coach. And he, when he left Georgia Tech, he went to back up north to Pittsburgh and you know they he he, he built uh, mean Joe Green made him a, a actually a defensive model Coca-Cola uh, so 
when when Bill Foot came, I think year I, we never even spoke the entire year. And if it hadn't been for Steve Sloan, Joe Namath's roommate at Alabama, came out of the Falcons camp, and they, he was the OC offensive coordinator. Um, he knew the game, and and so we we uh, I took him to the Liberty Bowl, and I just didn't play in the Georgia game, and then. He came back and thought, well, we, you know, you kicked off the team and you will not play in the bowl game. Well, hell, you don't get to the bowl game if it hadn't been for me. Notice it's a team sport. You got to have good players all the way around. So, but, you know, that's just, uh, that's, that's, that's the old news. So I, I can't, you know, couldn't live on that. And I came back and, and, um, rekindle my career down in Jacksonville, which is that Jacksonville's always been the the best city for me to win in. I I won my first game there playing Robert E. Lee. You, you might have, I'm sure, uh, Ryan, you've heard of them. And uh, we played yeah, in the Gator Bowl, the same. Yeah, Lee, Lee High School now is, um it's called, it's actually called uh, Riverside High School. Because now they wanted to get rid of they wanted to get rid of the Confederate general's name. So I heard, yeah. 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 So that so yeah, Robert E. Lee High School is 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 now called Riverside High School. So you got to play you got to play in the legendary Gator Bowl. So that's a big thing right there. Exactly. <laughs> and then when I played in the World Football League, we that was our home stadium. And uh, so I played in Doak Campbell Stadium. We played on, in high school, 25,000, 30,000 fans. I played at Florida Field. So, you know, I, I, would have, I was used to playing with a crowd. And uh, I always had uh, great supporters uh, in high school, that even in, in all of the Florida schools, Florida, Florida State, Miami, Central Florida, South Florida. And um, now I go there. I, I I go to some of the games when I'm down there um, during the fall. Uh, but uh, I, and another reason to, to be in Atlanta. Atlanta is a great place to be, regardless of your career choices or or whatever. And um, so I knew I would get an opportunity to do. Uh, advertising, which I'm doing now, and some some uh, directing, and uh, a nonprofit. I uh, got an ch- opportunity to expand Life University into an uh, international school of chiropractic. I, my f- very good friends, Anona Clayton, it was the highest ranking uh, female black female down at WTBS, and so she put me in with Ted Turner. And so we took uh, chiropractic, which Life College, to Life University and, and made them international. Uh, and so now I work for the foundation that founded Life College. So it's, you know, it's still in the family. Uh, his oldest daughter is CEO. And uh, something that you can't lose by doing it because you always uh, donating to the young and that's that's what it's all about donating uh to the future so we do that and uh we, we do we grow every every day uh something always new that we find out about uh college students is who we primarily deal with we donate in-kind gifts to them everything but cash <laughs> So I've been having some fun doing that, yeah. And of course, we had other jobs. Working. I worked with Maynard Jackson. I worked with Michael Lomax, who's, you know, he's uh, uh, he's over UNCF now, and you know they raised four or five four or five billion dollars up there for uh, HBCUs. Um, so I knew I would get. I wasn't thinking just only football because uh, most most uh, laypersons don't know that fifty uh, percent of the great players that come out of college don't get a chance to play because of injury. You know, you got running backs, uh, 
they they almost obsolete now. You, you, they can't even sign a contract, and it used to be held a running back did everything. So the game's changed, and you can't rely on it 100 percent or not even 80 percent. Um, so Atlanta's a great great city to be in. Uh, yeah, we still we still here. Uh, that was great information to hear from. Uh, you know, doing work with Life University. I have a good friend of mine that's a doctor that graduated from Life, uh, Doctor Richard Alexander. So he's uh, represent, he representing Life University proud man doing work. Yeah. So, yeah. Good. So great bit, man. What you got for uh, Mr. Mackinshane? First and foremost, uh, honor and the privilege to meet you. <clears throat> okay, you kind of low. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you better. All right, cool. So, September 12th, 1970, your first career start. You played against the South Carolina Gamecocks. Can you give the fans uh, a brief synopsis of that game? Y'all were trailing in that game, and you threw through two critical touchdowns, and y'all, y'all overcame that deficit and won 23-20. Well, I've always been good at comebacks. I've, uh, from high school all the way through. Uh, matter of fact, the last game I played in the Gator Bowl with Jacksonville Sharks, uh, I brought them back last touchdown uh, with less than a half minute left. And on the last play of the game, I blew my, my knee out. On trying, we had to run the ball instead of kicking the ball, so it was we had won the game, and then if we just going through the formality of running the extra point, and I stayed in the game, nobody would ever think you just you have a career ending injury on the last play of the game and you already won it, but it happened that way down there. But uh, uh, high school. Uh, double overtime in Jacksonville Coliseum. I hit the last points. Uh, by the way, I played basketball left-handed because I wore my right arm out during football season. And then so I've, we, I've always had those overtime games and the comeback games. It's been the story of my uh, athletic career. Nice, nice, nice. Oh, okay. Yeah. But that I remember, still remember that South Carolina game. Now I, I still got some highlight reels of that. And a lot of times, you you know, you got to keep going. You, if you lose or you win, even if you have a great game, you got to just put that behind you and keep going. That's the thing about all, most sports are like that. Uh, you can't just dwell on a loss or a win. But I do remember that game. It was uh, probably my first or second game. Yeah, yeah. I think it was, I think it was your second game, but I think it was your first start at quarter. Oh, right, right. We right. We were kind of we we weren't moving the ball. Right. And uh, yeah, and see what happened was the quarterback then was a senior, and you know there's a lot of conversation about that but you know it's a team sport and the teams want wanting to win they don't care about loyalty and all of that i mean you know you you can um uh, you can't win with that if if the team's not doing good so i remember coming in on that and they of course the the the, the fans and a lot of the players and the alums got on the coach but the, uh like i said I, I had faith in bud carson uh Matter of fact, he came down personally at, to my high school and on signing date and signed me in. And uh, they, 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 the principal let school out. That was one of the <laughs> one of the one of the big things that I that I did with Bud Carson and and also he he was real friendly with a lot of movie stars and I got an opportunity to. To hang out with a lot of them during my time at uh, when he was uh, my coach, uh, my sophomore and junior year. So he he was a great guy uh, to be to to play play for. So I got a question for you, Mister Mack. Okay. All right. So from your playing days that you had and going back to it, 
Um, you also were good friends with Congressman John Lewis, God rest his soul. Saw a good, saw a nice picture of you guys together, and you talked about Andrew Young, first mayor. Um, talked about um, talking about Mr. John Lewis, and now w- one detail that was missed. Who was in the limousine with you that day? Was that Jesse Jackson with you that day in the limousine when you guys were out of the bowl game? Yeah, it was Jesse Jackson. And a lot of you may not have heard of Maxine Smith. Maxine Smith would be something like uh, Jose Williams was over here in Atlanta in Memphis. Mm-hmm. But only, you know, of course, she's a female. And they wanted to make sure that uh, nothing happened and uh, make sure that uh, they there was a presence and that it was understood that this don't normally happen. You get a quarterback to take you all the way to the bowl game and you, you miss one game and then you, you get kicked off the team. So uh, that was not normal. That had never been done. Well, they, they've had some white players back, mm-hmm. I think, during Dodd, Bobby Dodd's turn, uh, that were kicked off the team uh, for for something more than that, you know, that they did, and they just thought that okay, you don't play the Georgia game, you had a great season, and uh, bygones be bygones, and you play in the bowl game, and then possibly get a better draft pick. So it didn't work out like that, and uh, they still they still dwelling on it. Well, you know that's that's always been the case. That's the, the whole deal about uh, mm-hmm. unfair treatment all the way across the board. Well, we and and you spoke on that. We like you were saying, there's still a lot of a lot of uh, players that still have gone through that. One guy and. and I'm sorry if I'm going to piss off some of my Georgia fans. I apologize, but I got to call a spade a spade. You know, the guy that we're trying to get to Atlanta right now, Mr. Justin Fields, it was a lot of politics. And I, and I can vouch for this because Solomon Kinley plays for, played for my cousin down at Reigns high school down in Jacksonville, same school that produced Brian Dawkins, Harold Carmichael, and so many other legends that played in the NFL and Sean Jefferson, one of the Atlanta Falcons who played for us. He came out of that same school. So yeah. I had access and I talked to Solomon about it. It wasn't main, it really wasn't heavy with the coaching side. It was mainly the boosters and the it was mainly the boosters at that time that wanted Jake Fromm over Justin Fields, even though we know the talent was we know which where the talent stood. We'll just say that. Fromm yeah. did his job. Right. He had two great running backs, but you apparently see what happened when Fields went to Ohio State. No, he didn't win a national championship, but 63 touchdowns and nine interceptions and two high Heisman yeah. candidate. Um, two high t- uh, I'm getting a little tongue twisted. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Two times that he was nominated for the Heisman Trophy. So you can't deny the young man's talent. He's just been in a bad situation in Chicago. Like you were saying, Mr. McIshan, when you played back in the day, it wasn't the talent wasn't the problem. And most fans don't understand. It's not the talent. It's the team that you're on and that you're playing around. A lot of the time, if you're not, if you're lacking talent, you're not going to be able to shine, especially at the quarterback position, if you don't have anybody to catch the ball. Because yeah. that's what Justin Fields went through in Chicago. And I think if he he had better pass catchers, you saw what happened when they gave him DJ Moore and Cole oh, Komet was actually healthy. That was right. a problem. Yeah, he 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 was fortunate that he didn't get hurt because he had to had to run around a lot back there, and he had to run out of there. Exactly. And, uh, then they got more. He's just he's just his 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 uh, pressure up on him. But you know, I, I'm with uh, all the other sports writers, the black ones anyway, like Terrence Moore. Why would you pass getting Justin Fields for what you got now? Yeah, I mean. You got automatic fans coming from Kennesaw and all the rest of the surrounding areas. But I, I think they had that Michael Vick complex. And so, you know, uh, that 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 had a lot Ooh. to do with it. They they feel like we all are like that might happen again. Uh, but not, this is not, what I don't get. Not not the the dog we talked fans, about it. Something else. And so that would turn the fans off. We, we, you're going to get another one of them, you know. So. so 
So, Mr. Magashan, because my me and my guys, we've talked about this before. We got a guy that's in our group who defends Kyle Pitts with his life. So, shout out to my guy Scoop or whatever. He he stands on that hill alone. I gotta I gotta shout him out. But we've talked about this before. When we actually spoke on it, we were like, okay, what's the deal with now? You spoke on Justin Fields coming in. Here's the thing: the kid's never been in trouble off the field. His dad is a police officer, so he, you know, he had no choice but to stay to stay straight because his dad was law enforcement. Now we know there's some law enforcement officers that's got some bad kids, but you know, and then the kid scored high to where he had Yale, Brown, all the Ivy League schools yeah, wanted oh him. Yeah, he, he's a straight guy. It's just the idea that you're gonna get another one after the first one do bad. It, it's 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 unbelievable unbelievable how they would think that that you know that do you think he survives in Atlanta think- if he gets here? With all the weapons that they have now, because we want to kind of touch on what do you think about like the NFL now? Because you mentioned some names, and I'm gonna let my guys jump in, but mm-hmm. I want to ask you because you were the first to carry the mantle of being the first black quarterback in the city of Atlanta, and the city that you represented has a population that's heavy that looks like us. But okay. we also know, and I'm not saying that to be funny, but we also know that there are some some straight laced folks that don't look like us that are in the city that they, they stand for right is right. Wrong is wrong. And it's still a lot of people that feel like he should have been here instead of Kyle Pitts. And there's no disrespect to Pitts, but we needed a quarterback. And now if we'd have had something back then or taken a quarterback in that draft, I think we probably would be in a better situation. But do you think that Justin Fields, if he gets to Atlanta with the weapons that they have provided, during Arthur Smith's tenure, do you think they, that they can actually help uh, jumpstart his career to making him a much better quarterback and he can showcase his talents a little bit more instead of just running around being an athlete? Well, yeah. Well, you just look at it. You got to, you playing in a dome stadium. You, the weather's going to be good every game. You don't have to play in that Chicago snow or blizzard or whatever. Uh, you know, so that, that right there alone. And then he's from the area that that would encourage him some. It has to. He's got more fans. He's got uh, his, his whole surrounding is is going to be is three sixty five off season. He's going to be great promoter for the Falcons if they get him. I I don't, I just don't think they will because because they got the black coach. Um, they they uh. I just knew they weren't going to get him, but they needed it. And so now well, maybe they got a shot. Maybe uh, I just think with McKay and and that other guy, that I thought they should have gone with, with McKay out the loop. McKay out the loop then. So. Oh, he is? He out the loop. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I, I know he just seemed like he had a, a no-cut deal. <laughs> I mean, he had a no cut deal, but he's been cut out the loop because it, it, we're not, we're tired of the same old family. We're trying to, you know, turn a new leaf, and that's what the ownership is trying to do. I can believe now. Okay, well, that's that's good. That's good. They, uh, I, I just think they, 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 I could draft better than them with no money, but I don't know. I just, you know, that's just my feeling. I, I um. I, it's, it's really something to see who are they going to choose or how they're going to reconstruct the team uh, to to get some production out of the wide receivers. Hell, they got, what, two so-called great wide receivers, and they none, neither one of them's been thrown to that much. Uh, and then, you, you, of course, you know, the quarterbacks, they're not, they not stable. So... It just seems that they they're not drafting right, and you know the the way that they've been drafting the defensive linemen, and I don't know the the oldest lineman in the league, and he the best lineman. I mean that's that's not that's not saying too much for your team when you you got a seventeen year vet. He's your best lineman. With all of the players coming out now, you should be able to to draft better than that, but. You know what, Mr. Magashan, you you hurt my boy Scoop's feelings. Look, you hurt my boy Scoop's feelings tonight because 
You spoke about Desmond turnover Ritter. That's what we call him. He turn he throws interceptions like he turns over like he turns over pastry. I'm just being honest. It's a turnover king right there. Uh -oh. Hey man. Hey, look, it is what it is, man. I mean, you call it, you call you, you call it a spade. I'm not gonna like that one. <laughs> we call him a spade a spade. I mean, he called him a spade but no, a spade. But that's, I mean, but that's hey. good because we have finally we have somebody. We finally have somebody that's going to speak out and tell the truth like we've been doing for the longest. And I know I've been catching flack for it, but now we have somebody who played at a high level and understands the game. Not just a student of the game, was a professional and played in the World Football League back in the day because a lot of your former NFL players, such as Paul Warfield, Larry Zonka, Jim Kick, and some of those guys, they slid over. And a matter yeah. of fact, and the Atlanta Falcons own Alfred Jenkins, one of our best What's receivers that? played in the World Football League back in the they, day. They they bought some hell of a players, you know. Exactly. To, it's just the money. A good marquee in their cities, yeah. So how yeah, was they, the money in that situation for you? That was what well, I that was gonna be my they, next question for you. How was the they, money and what was the business like and why did they fold? Well, it was just a terrible setup. The the owners ran with He froze. He froze. He froze. He froze. He'll, it'll come right back. Just give it a minute. But you know, Scoop so Falcons fans, it. while while we're waiting on Mr. McIshan's screen to get back right, um, let's just let's just be real, man. That was that was a beautiful thing. Like Scoop, he care. actually called out a lot of the stuff that I've been saying since day one. Thank you, Mr. McIshan. We got somebody uh, who, who's validating everything I've said. And this is and I didn't discuss this with him. So I'm enjoying this right now. Oh, I'm telling you, you right now. Y'all oh, know, know I'm enjoying it. Oh, I know. I know you are. Know this you is are. the first look. Normally, you know I'm humble and I'm gonna sit back and I'm just gonna be like, you know what? It is what it is. No, you but, take this all in. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna take it all in. Because y'all <laughs> and you are you were one of the main contributors. You, Tonio, Scoop, I'm putting names on it. Look, y'all was like giving this. me grief about this, I and said, I said it. I said you needed a damn a quarterback, I and now you're seeing it. No, here's my thing. I I agree with you, but I said <laughs> don't backpedal now. No, I'm not backpedaling. <laughs> I'm a thin ten toed down. Well, all I'm okay. Saying, all I'm saying is give him a chance. That's all I said. I said give him a chance. That's it. I again. I said, I said either we pick a quarterback or we pick a defensive player. Those were my two options. Man, K-Dub, go ahead, man. I'm hey, going to provide a dirty that's, birds layer real quick. This link that's so why we, uh, we can see people uh, talking. So give me a second, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to provide this link while K-Dub talks. <laughs> no, I mean, I just wanted to just say, I'm just like, you know, the guy the guy can't perform if they don't have a quarterback to throw him the football. I mean, like I say, you know, he had a great season when uh, he had somebody worth a damn throwing the football, you know, Matt Ryan was, mm -hmm. he was on his last leg, but you've seen a guy that can pull the trigger. I just feel like you go ahead and right your wrong because you have, I think they have an offer on the table. If you go ahead and go get Justin Fields like we've been talking about, mm -hmm. you have a chance for this man to throw to the guy. And, and like I say, you know, it, it came a few years later, but sometimes you don't know how the, the union or the marriage is going to work, but that's the way it came around. That's why the, the previous coaching staff was fired because they made a lot of bad bonehead decisions as a coaching staff and as an organization. So now we have a, a confident staff. We can just look at the staff and look at it and say it's confident. You know, we, we looked at his uh, staff that he put together the previous regime. And we're like, what the heck? Why you got this guy coaching this? And he's, you know, we had that this question that we had in the bird case. So now you have guys coaching in the right positions in the right departments where they need to be at. So the sky's the limit, man. Like I say, get your quarterback, get you multiple quarterbacks. Like I say, I think they need to trade for fields, draft a guy. And uh, and 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 try to develop Ritter if you're going to keep him on that rookie deal. So have a, have a plethora of quarterbacks and let the best man win. Like I said, if it's Fields, it's Fields. But it make it, it could be that rookie that you got that you uh, end up drafting. You don't know who's going to take off in practice. Because like I said, that playbook is getting thrown at everybody at the same time. Everybody has to pick up the lingo, the verbiage, 
that you know everything has you know everyone is learning their receivers. You know, Desmond may have a, le- a little leg up because he's worked with these receivers, but he don't really have a leg up because of the fam he has. He has you know he's turns the ball over too much. You have oh. to work on going through his reads and yes. making the right decision, pulling the trigger when he has to do that. So other than that, I mean that's what I feel about it. Now here's the thing that pissed me off earlier today. Now I think Mr. McIshan, I think Mr. McIshan's phone went out because we were having an interview, and I think he might have lost power. Okay. So we're still gonna wait for him for a little while, but we're gonna definitely, hopefully, he comes back on. But one of the guys that I and I mentioned this in one of the shows, and you can vouch for this, K Dub. Okay. I said Georgia needs. I said Atlanta needs to go ahead and look at Javon Bullard for that nickel position. I've been saying that. I said that. I said if it's anybody that you get. You get an impact player in a Javon Bullard, or if you don't do that, go ahead and get Cedric Von Prine Granger and get a proven center in here, a guy that plays this position and specializes in that, and move Hen Dog to the guard spot because Hennessy was a very good guard. Period. I'm all I'm all I'm all for the bell ringer. I mean, anybody out of Georgia, but you know, especially the bell ringer. I mean, that's just that, that's just uh, that's just my. Uh, <laughs> This he is my the bell. Wait a minute, you call him the bell bringer? Oh Lord. The, yeah, the bell bringer, because I will bring your bell. Bring oh, no. your bell. Oh, no. Yeah. You went back to need a warrant on that. Okay. I mean, I mean, I mean, that, I mean he said talk, he said <laughs> talk to you. He said talk to your, your top three pick, Mr. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. Ask him why he called him the bell ringer. That's what he I'm told. I'm telling you, boy, that so yeah. I, I, I and I'm gonna be honest with you. I think outside of some of these Georgia players, I've already said, I've already staked my claim. I'm HBCU strong. This is a draft where I want to see one or two of those guys in Atlanta that can ball. I've said that. I've said that for the longest, and I'm gonna stand ten toes down on it. Again, Derry, like I said, you want to have. I, I think you need to build build up this quarterback room. But at the same time, another thing you might want to do: go ahead and start looking at your pass catchers in this draft as well, oh, because. It's a lot. Yeah, I mean, this is a receiver. Xavier draft. Worthy's this gonna be a first rounder, so we're not gonna have a deal. We're not gonna have we gonna, we're not gonna have a chance at that. But I see us going after an AD Mitchell type of receiver. That's I think me. I think AD goes before Xavier Worthy. That's just I think AD Mitchell's on a high on a lot of people draft boards. He will be going higher than the people expect. That's just my opinion on that. Hmm. Well. This is a receiver's draft. This I mean, is a no, it's a, draft. no, you're right. You're right. Because A.D. Mitchell showed moments where in big games where he was clutch. He a top he five receiver game. coming out. He he's a top moments. he's a top five receiver coming out, in my opinion. Not just because he played at Georgia, but he, he did it at Georgia and he then he went down to Texas and did it. And did the same months. thing he was doing at Georgia. So it wasn't like you said, and, and here's the thing. Now we had some dog fans who were misunderstood and they don't understand what happened. The reason AD went to Texas was because of his daughter. He had to take care of his daughter, and he honestly had to get back home because it was some situations off the field. And there was a lot of people in the media, and and, and I hate to say it, but some of our own fan base that were giving him grief for leaving, and they were saying, oh, well, he's he's not this here. and da, 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 da. No, he left because he needed to take care of his business at home. And here's the thing. Family comes before everything, period. Family comes before everything. This is a way for him to feed his children, his daughter, and this is a way for him to get some things squared away on the financial side so she doesn't have to work as hard later in life. But at this point, I think he would be a receiver that I would go after in this draft. Malik Neighbors is the big name, but I'm just going to be honest with you. Neighbors is definitely a solid player. But the guy that if we don't get any of those guys, I would take the kid Leggett out of South Carolina. Big, fast, strong. If you if you want to combine, put it this way, you can put Jerry Rice's hands on Sterling Sharp's body with who who would I say speed wise that I would compare him to? Because he's big and he's big and fast. I would have to say, heck, I would have to say I'd even put him in the in a category of Julio Jones with the speed. Because we saw what he could do at South Carolina. And he only had Spencer Rattler. It was just those two. And they put up great numbers. I, so, got, a guy. I got a guy for you. Who? Uh, and actually, Steve Smith put me, on this, uh, put me on this guy. His name, if you ever watched the University of, uh, of San Antonio, 
Mm-hmm. Joe Griffin. Out of tech, big foot two. Quincy Carter talks about him all the time because Quincy Carter's quarterback he trains works out with them all the time. So, yeah, Q, Q Carter talked about him. Big foot two. This dude only dropped one pack out of the whole 2023 season. One. He can he's tough under the middle. He knows the route tree. Might be he might be he he need he still needs a little bit of development. But I'm telling mm-hmm. you right now, he's gonna be a diamond in a rough, whoever gets this guy. He under he understands leverage, he has good feet, he's not as fast. But if you talk about that good progression wide receiver, come out that I can take a hit and pop right up and shake it off like it ain't nothing. Might want to keep your eye on that guy. I'm gonna give you a guy who I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you a name for, and this is a guy that I I would take, you know, right off the rip. And the guy that I would take would probably be Devontae's Walker. Came, you know, started off at Kent State first, went to North Carolina, balled out, top receiver. He got suspended from majority of the season, and that is a name that's been flying under the radar. And this young man. Is from, you know, he's a Charlotte, North Carolina kid, so he's right up the road being from Charlotte. But he came down to Kent, you know, he pretty much played in the MAC, balled out there, and then goes to UNC and becomes one of Drake May's best targets once they get over the yeah. NCAA, once they got over those NCAA sanctions that went down. And truthfully, if you pair him in this offense with the Drake London, B. John Robinson, um, and then you have your Kyle Pitts, I think that this kid could take the top off of a defense. Solid, great route runner. He's physical at the point of attack when he blocks because the original coach that he played for is, you know, it was def- it was Deion Sanders' offensive coordinator out in Colorado that got fired. But when he when that gentleman was the head coach at Kent State, you saw what Kent State did to Georgia in 2022 in their house. Oh yeah, they brought it. And De- and Devontae Walker was one of those big time players that was that was beating us down in that game. So. If you want to go back and look at the footage of how dominant he was, that is a guy that you would bring into Atlanta, and he fits the culture perfectly. When I'm talking about not a troublemaker, a, a guy that stands up for what's right, follows the rules, but he's a hard-nosed football player that just takes no takes no BS off nobody. So that's something that I would – that's a guy I would look into that's not a popular name right now. And yeah, also, I just want to throw that out there just because, uh, you know, he's a, a dog. I would love me some uh, whoa, laddie. Uh, he could be our uh, Cooper Cup to our offense with Mr. Zach Attack. I'm just throwing. Hey, look. I know, I know I, he got to throw it out there. I know he got to throw it out there. That's it. Listen. So, if it happens, I'm like, I was over. Hockey fan since I've known him. Lad won, Lad won me over. Later on in the second season, you know, and this, and this year that just went by, he won me over because I'm gonna be honest with you. I honestly still say Dylan Bell should have got the ball and he should have got the ball more. But K Dub will tell you he and I would get into keep, debates and but, arguments over this. But if he keeps doing it on the professional level at the NFL I know level, you can't knock you can't knock him. But you gotta you gotta admit, you look at AD Mitchell, you look at Dylan Bell, you look at some of these receivers that we've had at University of Georgia. And they underutilized them because they were just feeding Lad and Brock. That's Adrian, just what it is, though. Adrian Smith is another one. He, and he, yeah, he, eighty and, and Smith. Smith is a na- another one. Like, I, and I'm gonna tell you right now, Anthony Evans the third is gonna be a guy that's gonna if he stays healthy. That is a guy that we could bring into Atlanta as well. But outside of outside of the Division One guys, you know, I always speak on the HBCU players that are coming out. And, you know, it's just – it's one of those things where it, it, all you can do is just sit back and hope that these guys get an opportunity because, oh, yeah. you yeah. know, the defensive lineman that we spoke on, Zarian Hayes, is out of Alabama A&M. The last Alabama A&M defensive lineman that came into the league and that literally wrecked shop and was hell for everybody was Robert Mathis. Atlanta and Atlanta and Atlanta kid. Mm. Rex Shop. You know, he's also a brother of Omega Sci-Fi. Shout out to those boys. Shout out to the Q's out there. You know, we we you know, like I said, I got some family there, some dogs and whatnot, but you know, you got some Sigmas out there too. My Uncle Corey. Shout out to my Uncle Corey. Thank you for helping me set up the interview, even though Mr. At Coach uh Mr. McIshan's phone went dead. I apologize about that, ladies and gentlemen, but we definitely were blessed to have him on for a little while, but we're going to bring him back because he actually says he loves the show. But um, getting back to it, 
I think we could take Azarian Hayes on the defensive line, but when you look at some of the top prospects that are coming out, there are some guys that I, I believe that could have started anywhere in the country. Oh yeah. I mean, oh, oh yeah. And 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 <laughs> like I told you, it's two, it's a kid, Matthew Foster out of Virginia State, six, six foot seven, 315 pound offensive lineman. I would take. You got Tariq Stewart out of North Carolina A T, six foot six, three hundred pounds. You know, and I mean, he's one of those guys that <laughs> that definitely is, you know, definitely is is a dangerous is dangerous. And then we're talking about special teams, right? We lost Avery Williams. There's a kid out of North Carolina Central named Brandon um, Cordrington, and he's a punt returner. You know, he was he finished as high as I think third in the NCAA Division One FCS. And he averaged 15 to 20 yards a punt in his sophomore season in 20, 2021. And he also is a defensive back. So he has good ball skills, security, and quickness, but he can also play defense as well. So I think that that would be a plus to bring in a guy who could help us out on special teams as a return man. And also he could provide depth in the secondary for the defensive backs. What do you guys feel about that? For me, I'm, the versatility. Yeah, I'm looking at the coaching staff. I think they're going to key in on trying to get the most versatile players that we can in this draft, especially up front, especially on the back end. So I look for Coach Gray, and I look for uh, Re- Raheem Moore to re-key, uh, re-key in on players that can play not even multiple positions, that you can put them in on certain plays or whatnot. To get maximum, get maximum production. So I'm kind of excited on how Coach Raheem Morris and Terry Finals attack this draft. But yeah, there's a lot, a lot of talent, especially skill wise, in this draft that I've mm-hmm. seen in the last couple of years. Yeah, man, that's the way I, I feel about it. I feel like it, no stone is unturned. They'll be hitting those uh, HBCU, uh, those ranks because we have those coaches that have uh, a lot of familiarity with that. The coaches that we brought in, they have a lot of familiarity with the uh, black college scene, the HBCU scene. So we're going to be going after all those guys. I think I think this regime will be taking Georgia players the way he spoke highly of uh, Curry Smart and his and the, and the way the dogs move. So I feel like we'll take a dog in this draft. That's why it could be a, it could be a lad country. It could be a, a a bell ringer. I mean, it could be one of those guys. It'll, it'll Got one for you. Take. No one spoke about Marcus Rosemary Jack Saint either. And he and he's he's quiet and he's quiet and he's quietly and he's quietly had you know a great come I mean that combine a great workouts at the Senior Bowl and I, I think he's going to have a great combine out also so that's another receiver that we can get in the you know late later rounds that could really help us. Now y'all know I hate now y'all know I hate Grambling State just like I hate the University of Florida and I and I can't stand Alabama either. But I gotta give I gotta give a shout out to you know Grambling State because I'm just gonna give you a comparison. If you want to look at Marcus Rosemary Jack Saint, his his he's built like Michael Irvin, but if you look at his route running and you look at his hands, he plays like the legendary Charlie Joyner who played for the San Diego Chargers back in the day. Hmm. Also for the you know, remember Joyner Charlie Joyner bounced around before he got to San Diego, and he played in that Bill Walsh offense back in the day, um, in Cincinnati back in the day for those early those early Bengal teams, and he wasn't that effective because he didn't fit their system. But once he got to that Air Coriel system and he got seasoned, he became one. And he also dealt with injuries, just like Marcus Rosemary Jack Saint did in his early in his career. And Charlie Joyner was one of the best pass catchers of all time. And, you know, even though he's a Grambling State alum, he's an Eddie Robinson boy. You got you know, you got to give him his props because he was one of the best receivers to ever play the game. So if I had to compare somebody, I would compare. I'm not saying that he that Marcus Rosemary Jackson is going to have a career like his. We don't know, but I I would have to compare him physically to that. Now, another guy that I would love to see would be a doozy, a woozy, a doozy from uh, Washington. That is another guy who I wouldn't mind seeing in Atlanta because great route runner, good hands, and is tough at the point of attack and showed that he could take a hit and hold on to the football. So. You know, we always talk about defense and everything, but I love talking about the I love talking about the wide receivers. Ooh, I'm sorry, that's on me, bro. 
No, Duze, I would just want to throw that in there. I think he's going top 10. We won't have a chance of him. I mean, I think he's the best receiver in the draft. That's just my opinion. I'm going to leave it like that. Hey, I think I'm not disagreeing with you on that. He showed why. <laughs> Yeah, he's yeah like, I mean, he's well, I mean, he's I mean, I know he's top three, but a lot of people are saying maybe Marvin Harrison Jr. or they're saying neighbors, but I just really feel like the Duzier is a better receiver, the best receiver in this draft, and he'll be, and he'll be outstanding if we was to get him and put him in the slot. I would put him in the slot and let him work and just work the hell out of folks. <laughs> we had to move Man. back in. We had to move back in first to get him. <laughs> so the coach you spoke. So the coach that you spoke on. Um, that had HBCU ties was KJ Black. That was one of those guys that we were talking about. He he recruits really, you know, he recruits really well because not only did he play at that level, he also knows the FCS level. When you talk about like the Valdosta States, the um, the Saginaw Valley States, he knows those smaller schools. So I think that I like like you said, I'm looking at how Raheem Morris built the staff. Raheem Morris has built this staff to where they're going to be able to look at everything from all levels. And I believe we're going to see what this scouting department does now that Arthur Smith is gone. Let's see if this scouting department improves because if the scouting department improves and we're able to get better quality players into Atlanta, and I'm not saying that we have a bad team now, but I think we can get better players. That's just my opinion. And if we can get better players to come into Atlanta, we have a chance to actually do something in the NFC because Honestly, the only teams that showed that they were dominant this year, Detroit, San Francisco, Green Bay is going to be a problem. Dallas, you know, Dallas is going to play well during the season, and they're going to fold as they do like an old cheap paper fan at, Ar <laughs> at Ebenezer Baptist Church off Auburn Avenue. They're going to fold as usual. And, you know, I got an uncle who talk, talk a bunch of trash or whatnot. He a Cowboys fan. He always mess with me, say, there ain't no good SEC quarterbacks. Y'all can take him back to the SEC. Well, y'all did pick up, y'all did make a fourth round quarterback your starter and give him all that money. So they ain't got nothing to do with the SEC because well, last no time choice. I checked, a Georgia Bulldog quarterback won a Super Bowl. Regardless had, of how you put it, and he's going to be a Hall of Famer. So they had, they had no choice. <laughs> they had Tony Romo, and that man was going to literally on his leg. Exactly. Leg. <laughs> <laughs> that man they got had, him. They had Romo. That whole time or whatever, and Romo could never win when it counted. So, yeah, that man. He got but enough about these old sorry stinking cowboys. We gonna let them. We gonna let them ride off in the sunset. You know, it's not much difference between the Dallas Cowboys and the Sack of Manure. Just gonna keep it a buck with you. Ain't much of a difference. And they fan and their fans are just like that too. They smell just as bad as that bag bag of manure, as I would say. So, yeah, I said it, and I and I stand on it or whatnot. I don't like the Cowboys, and I don't like them stinking Saints either. So, oh, no. but let me stop clowning, man. Let me get out of my bag, out of my feelings or whatever. You know, I got to coordinate. We having a show. I got to coordinate with y'all. You know what? I still wouldn't mind that defensive tackle from Texas and put him alongside of. <laughs> he, of he's Brady. not going to be there. No. K Dub said that last week. No, when I mentioned here. that, he ain't going to be there. No. <laughs> no. I mean, certain, certain players is not. This, this is not a defensive. Uh, lineman type of draft. I mean, it's just not. I mean, you have to go hit, address those things in a free agency and then attack the, uh, the players that are deep in this draft. Like the receivers we're talking about. Maybe the back end uh, or the safeties and the, and the uh, quarterbacks. I mean, focus on what we can focus on, the things that are deep in this draft, and we what have the, the we have the money. Uh, old lineman, you can but – if you – but. The thing about our O line is, if you stack our O line across the thirty-two teams, we have a pretty good line. You can always add. Is the only thing we need. Exactly. I mean, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm being honest now. Stack us up against the, the rest of the thirty-two teams in the league. We can always improve on something. Every line, but we can we always run the add ball to our line. Better than anybody in the league. We, we really don't run have the ball better than anybody in the league. I stand what, on that. That's but what we I'm just trying to get, get that passing game down. Well, we can bring in guys to help or facilitate our line, but looking at our line across the whole league, we don't have a bad line. We no. need to quit talking so bad about it. We, have, I no, we just got a turnstile named McGarry. I still stand on that. We got the, boy is, the boy is recyclable. 
But like, like I'm saying, I will say go in, go into the draft and do your homework on the offensive linemen that are coming out. I'm not, I'm not opposed to not but taking that. Think about it. I gave you, I gave you three offensive linemen that you can get for pennies off the dollar and let those guys earn their earn their stripes. And the thing is, they're great at pass protection and they're also great at being able to run block as well. So when you look at those guys that I gave you, and I gave you three HBCU offensive tackles, I didn't get into the Division One guys yet. We'll get into those next week. But I had to make sure that I put out, you know, like I said, I'm always going to show love to my boys coming up out of, out of the schools that nobody don't want to look at. But those three, you got a guy that's six foot seven, 315 pounds that literally can move from sideline to sideline and within five to ten yards has one of the quickest bursts and at the point of attack, just literally is like a Mack truck and run blocking, and it's like a big mountain or a roadblock, as you would say. And Who pass protect doesn't get, and he doesn't give up that many sacks. Who does so he play for? I would look at that guy, you know, at Virginia State. But hey, let's see what let's see what happens. But um, no, I mean, look at, I mean, definitely look at. Like I said, do your homework on these guys. But what I'm saying is, you can always bring in guys like the guy from, um, we said Norfolk State. Oh, Virginia, no, State. Oh, Virginia State. Okay, so for Virginia State, I'm not knocking these guys. Bring them in, help to prove that line. But what I'm saying is, focus on the players that are high in this draft. That we are deep in this draft. Don't go for don't go reaching. If you can get those, you might can get that guy you're talking about as a seventh rounder or undrafted no. free agent. But what I'm saying is, that, don't. that's what I'm saying. You can bring them in that way because here's the thing: mm. you're not gonna hit. You're not gonna hit everybody. You're not going to hit on everybody right off the bat. You know what I'm saying? We already know that because your best – everybody knows this. Your best players that you get that are going to be solid and they're actually not just solid, they're actually going to be your starters and they're going to be your Hall of Famers later in life, those are going to be your – low. those are going to be from the third round on down. The first round guy is supposed to be great. The second round guy is supposed to be great as well. But if you look at the way that the NFL has gone so far – I mean, the history of it, most of your best players are lower tier guys because they have more of a chip on their shoulder than anything. Now, you do have a lot of great first round picks that, that do well. They do. They do well. Hall of Fame careers. But you have more lower round guys that are Hall of Famers than you have these first round guys. It's the honest to God truth. And it's the no, show that. No, I'm not saying that because I feel like you can you can do better with without all the pressure upon you. You know what I'm saying? That's just yeah. a, like that's like if you go get uh onto a job and they took you and they paid you X Y Z. It makes a lot of pressure because they want you to show up and show out at that particular job. But they brought you in. Uh, they really inspect a lot of you, and you came in and you and you showed up and showed out. It's a different perspective. That's what I'm trying to get at. I'm not saying that first round picks don't succeed or don't uh, do succeed, but sometimes they they just crumble under the pressure of being that number one pick and having to perform right, right when they get to the organization, or they may fold under the pressure of making so much money early, or they can just fold under the pressure of, like I say, you know they they were highly touted. But the talent doesn't match up and match up. So, like I said, it's a lot of factors that go into it. Sometimes you just don't go get to the right situation, the right coaching. Like via, uh, like like Justin Fields, you just go to the wrong situation for your mm. talents. I mean, so I mean, it's a lot of things that go into when you draft it. So, uh, hopefully, they do the the right due right due diligence and the research. And like I said, stick to your guns. I mean, don't don't overthink it and go in and like I said, and, and, uh, and execute it at the highest level. You get the right guys for Atlanta and move forward. Well, we're going to wrap it up with this here, guys, because, again, like we said, Black History Month or whatnot, um, it was just one of those things tonight where I had to, you know, I just had to bring some things up tonight because it was just beautiful that we were able to to have a legend like Mr. Eddie McIshan on the show. But I also said I wanted to make sure that I showed um, – I talked about Marion Motley last week uh, being one of the forgotten four. He's one of the greatest running backs of all time. Mm. And I want to bring, you know, I want to go ahead and bring a little something with Mr. Marion Motley in mind um, for the show. So I'm actually getting this footage that I said I was going to show this week. And I just want to make sure that we, you know, we actually get this thing right. So Marion Motley, I'm going to tell a little bit of the story. Marion Motley, Cleveland Brown. Um, 
you know, he did, he went to junior college for about a year. Once he got out of college or whatnot, he was in the army, did his time, played um, at a military base when they had military teams back in the day playing. Um, mm-hmm. And he worked, you know, he worked a factory job. Paul Brown called him into, um, called him into for a tryout. And whether you guys know it or not, Marion Motley is a good old Georgia boy too, by the way. Good old Mactown Georgia boy. So, you know, it's something about these running backs that come out of the state of Georgia. It's something about them. I don't know what it is, but it's just something about them. So I'm going to go ahead and and show you guys this video of Marion Motley. Fair, Fair use, fair use, fair use. So I got to make sure I do that for you guys. And um, we're without further ado, we're going to talk about Mr. Marion Motley tonight. I guess this, uh, I guess it didn't want to start. So here we go. Ah, we got the sound ready. So fair use, fair use, fair use. Without further ado, Mr. Marion Motley. I was 12 years old, and I'll tell you, when you have a hero when you're 12 years old, he's a hero that you have for the rest of your life. He's a hero for me for as long as I live. The great players of any era can play in any other era, and Marion was one of those. If he walked in today, he'd start for any team in the league. In his era, I think he was the best of the fullbacks. He was a big man. The mammoth Motley, 238 pounds of football dynamite. He was 40, 50 pounds bigger than some of the guys that were playing in his day. Motley football's version of the atomic bomb. He was like Earl Campbell in more recent times, that he was a collision runner. He'd hit people and they'd fall off and he'd keep going. Big Marion Motley had a great day. He took a handoff from Otto and pulled and galloped his way for 58 yards. Old Mariuch is feared, and you got the idea why when he got moving on this one. And in his prime, boom, he had a burst to him. Boom, boom up the middle, taking off like a GI on a three-day pass. He shows his tremendous drive. Counting his four years in the old All-America Football Conference and five in the NFL, Marion Motley averaged 5.7 yards per carry, still the highest career average among running backs in pro football history. He was a great runner, but he was more than a great runner. My dad used to say that Marion was the greatest all-around player ever. He was perhaps the best pass protecting back ever. So we have to pause it in between because we don't want it to get shut off. But just to give you a heads up, Marion Motley, outside of being a veteran and whatnot, he also played both sides of the ball. That was something that they didn't put out in the video because they talked about him being a great running back. He also was a linebacker. So he he was one of the best to do it. Yeah, play linebacker, play defensive end. So whether you guys know it or not, Marion Motley was there, and after his career ended, he had knee injuries, unfortunately. That was what ended his career. And Jim Brown was the next running back that they drafted by the Cleveland Browns. Another defensive end. Exactly. <laughs> and and then you had behind him Leroy Kelly, Morgan State's own HBCU legend. So you had three straight running backs who were Hall of Famers for the Cleveland Browns. So I'm going to go ahead and start the video back. Just wanted to stop it. So my people on Facebook, so they wouldn't have the video cut. Just wanted to make sure that we had this out for you guys. Fair use, fair use. He could take these rushers and just stone them. He just stopped them. And he was a willing blocker on runs. Touchdown number one, off tackle, with Motley throwing the key block. He had great hands. The Browns used to run a lot of wide flares and screens. He was a real threat at that. Beyond that, he was a guy who could go in and play as a linebacker. And the Browns used him as a linebacker in short yarding situations. He was considered the most talented 
of the Browns linebackers. He had the most physical ability. Browns played for the championship of their league in all eight of Motley's years with the team, winning five titles. We had some great players with those old teams. He ranked up there with Otto Graham. They were the two really key guys at the beginning of the Browns. It's the beginning of Motley's career that may be his most lasting legacy. In 1946, a full year before Jackie Robinson debuted with the Brooklyn Dodgers, Motley was one of four African-American players to break pro football's color barrier. We took a lot of abuse. Anything that they gave out, we took it, but we dished it back to them. I'd get my licks in. I kicked butts and took names, I can tell you that. And it made them respect the too. So I think I did what I had to do and did it right. It's been a long time since he came into pro football. And memories fade. People uh, probably don't have him in mind like they have later guys. But he was as good as any of them. I'm pretty selective. I don't have so many of them that I consider super, but I consider Marion Motley super. You want to talk about being tough. Ladies and gentlemen, that was... Mr. Marion Motley, one of the greatest running backs of all time. His record still his record still stands with average wise 5.7 yards a carry. That has not been broken. Jeez. And that's been over 40 years since he's played. God rest his soul. Jim Brown was had 5.2 yards a carry, but um the last person to actually get close to that was Bo Jackson. Bo had 5.4 yards a carry. He, but they didn't give it to him because he only played four years in the NFL. You'd had to play five years for that to be considered a record. So Marion Motley's 5.7 yards of carry still stands to this day. So salute to one of the greatest running backs slash, I'm sorry, I'm not even going to clap, no, one of the greatest football oh, players player. that there kicked in the door. Because as we said before, Black History Month, man, we were getting ready to set some trends. This is what we do. We had to make sure that we ended it right. We had the first black quarterback that played in the Southeast with Mr. Eddie Mackishan. Definitely appreciate him for coming on the show. And then we also had to pay homage to Mr. Marion Motley, who was one of the Forgotten Four. So I had to make sure I showed showed the Forgotten Four. I talked about Bill Willis last week with um, Mr. Dwight Stevenson, but had to make sure that we showed that for you guys. So, yes, it was a Georgia guy who still owns that record right now. So all my Georgia folks, man, stand up, beat your chest, take pride in it. So if anybody ever says that, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, go look it up. Marion Motley, 5.7 yards a carry. And his first eight years in the league, five championships. You do the math. Come on, man. Georgia Just power, saying. Man. Georgia power. <laughs> so without further ado, we definitely appreciate you guys for coming through. Um I appreciate my guys, Graybeard, K-Dub. Great show as always. You know, we had to do it big. We got some big things coming up. Um, if you're in the Baltimore area from tomorrow and the rest of the weekend, check out the CIAA tournament if you're around that way. HBCU basketball at its finest, man. A lot of celebrities come out. Um, outside of celebrities, you have legendary coaches. Matter of fact, Coach George Williams, Birdcage alumni, is going to be there this weekend because – He's, you know, he's also a CIAA um, legend as well in his right, scoring 25, 30 points again. That was without a three-point line, by the way. But um, <laughs> like I said, it's always a beautiful thing. But um, if you got your family with you, man, enjoy it. Tell them you love them because you never know when the next moment that you're going to see them. You know, like I said, I'm coming close up to getting close to the year of my grandmother being passed away. So it me it hits a little bit hard for me right now because that was my rock right there. So, you know, without her, I probably wouldn't have the edge of sports because she used to buy me magazines and books. So she and my mother got me started on that. So rest in peace, 
Miss Mercedes Broadnecks, you know, I miss you, baby, but I'm still kicking, baby. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep making you proud, just like we gonna keep making these folks proud out here of the birdcage, man. So check us out next week. We coming in here literally like Ali, you not gonna take our title. And for those who are biting us, it's okay. We gonna be like Roy Jones Jr. ducking you in his prime. He ain't gonna touch us. So without further ado, we love you guys. We'll holler at you later. And thank you guys for joining us and just continue because we got more interviews coming up this off season. We're not going to tell you who, but we got some big time names coming. So definitely I'll see you guys next week and y'all come, y'all come, come back next week. Don't, don't go away. Just come back. But we love you. Birdcage. We out yeah. here, baby. You either get right or you get left. Let's go. We out. Birdcage. You did what it is. <laughs>